ready for the next segment? We're going to move on to talk about our Northern California kelp forests, near the Neriocystis kelp forest, the great bull kelp. I think you're probably aware that they have been hammered over the last couple of years. And what I'm going to present now is some information about what is going on with them and what perhaps we can expect. So I'm basing a lot of this on these two papers about our marine heat wave and what tipped the bull kelp to a sea urchin barrens. This large scale shift in the structure of kelp forest ecosystems with an epizootic and marine heat wave. Epizootic is an epidemic among animals. COVID is an epizootic pandemic as well. So here is a demonstration of what has happened over time to kelp beds in Sonoma County and Mendocino County, which in 2008 had extensive kelp forests. But look how different their form is. These are quite close to the coast in all these coves. And these are more extensive and offshore. So these are the ones that you would see dampening the waves as they come toward shore. So that in here, it's much the water is much stiller. But not every kelp forest is the same. Every kelp forest takes advantage of the substrate below, the water and the currents. So this is kelp covering green. By 2014, they were already diminished, strongly diminished, and so on. Until recently, some of them have been locally decimated, gone, extinguished. Still, there are patches in some places of kelp forest. For example, if you go to Bodega Bay, there's a nice Neriocystis kelp forest out there. So here is a picture of a surface canopy of Neriocystis with its long hollow stipes, prominent floats, and then trailing large smooth blades, collecting light at the surface. This is a, like macrocystis, it reaches the surface and forms great forests from the bottom up. Without that forest, see how calm the water is? This is what it would look like, the same place without that kelp forest. Similarly, the understory plants, seaweeds and seagrasses are rich. This is the understory kelp pterogophora here, um, Dictyonurum, uh, Zostra, lots of animals. With the advent of overpopulation of urchins, you can see that the pterogophora is dying, the urchins are crawling up the stipes. Even the coralline algae, the Caliarthron, which is a huge understory species, is white and dead because without the shade of the canopy, light is penetrating and killing the understory from too much light, too much light. And the animals here, the crustose corallines here, abalone, other invertebrates, after the heat wave and the decimation of the kelp, you see purple urchins dominating, a few other invertebrates, but even the corallins have bleached, are green and are gone, they're dying. So this is a catastrophic change from a kelp forest community to one dominated by urchins. So if we look, I'm gonna to try to move this thing again. Hold on a sec. Well, this is one of these heat maps from cold to warm. And you can see this warm blob here. This is super warm and this is very warm. 
And there are a few just very close. There's a, a longshore current along here that is maybe upwelling, has kept a little bit of cooler water right close to the coast. But the heat blob hit us, um, I think it was 2019 here. Let's see, no. This is when the heat blob hit us first, and it was probably 2016, but the temperatures remained elevated for all these years. But eat, so people often say, oh, the heat, that's why everything's gone bad, but it isn't just the heat. It's multiple stressors. Way back here between 2009 and 2012, Pycnopodia, the great sunflower star, started to die from a viral disease. So here's where it, it was, you know, it comes, it comes, it goes, but it was peaking. And then it did a disastrous fallback to almost nothing way before the heat. Similarly, after Pycnopodia was gone, its favorite food, the purple urchin, rose up tremendously. So you remove the predator and the prey is released and grows in numbers. Um, this is density of abalone and it followed a similar trend. You can see this trend going like this. Later, the abalone, because the urchins were dominating and eating all the food, abalone depend on drift seaweed and they're all started to die off. So it's really, a cascade that started with a predator and the jumping up of the prey. And it was the heat wave that really affected the kelp. True, the urchins were affecting kelp too, but they, the kelp didn't really start disappearing until later. You can see the trend downward here. The heat started it and then the urchins took advantage of all that drift, they eat drift too, and the kelp disappeared. So these are all different places in Northern California where they've done this study counting the organisms um, to de define these trends. So this is what happens when a kelp forest dies, or this is one of the ways a kelp forest can die. A predator, an herbivore, associated invertebrates crash from lack of kelp. So what have we done in response? Well, we've spent a lot of time doing ecological monitoring, looking at the Nereocystis kelp forests. And this is amazing work by amazing people to do all the counting of invertebrates and plants to demonstrate these trends. And this ecological monitoring is absolutely important for continuing understanding our kelp beds. So other approaches to this decline in the kelp forest has been to grow more predators. So here is the larval form of Pycnopodia helianthoides, the sunflower star grown in the lab from squeezing eggs out of adult stars. Here are the juveniles, and this is a very vulnerable stage, but they've been grown in the lab to adult for reintroduction to eat urchins. This is one of the prongs of our human response to this kelp forest decimation. Another thing we've done is to actually work with urchin divers and urchin harvesters to collect and bring urchins into captivity and raise them. We have to raise them because when they're out here in the field with nothing to eat, They've eaten every understory species. They've even, even eaten some sessile invertebrates. There is no kelp to feed them. They are called zombie urchins because there's almost nothing to them but their internal skeleton, their skin, and their spines. They do not have gonads, and even their digestive system has shrunk. There's nothing there. So if we collect these from the field and raise them in captivity, we can then get gonads and raise them for uni for restaurants. 
So it's a way of capturing urchins in locally numerous populations. And instead of just killing them, taking them and repurposing them as a human resource. Interesting. Another thing we're doing is trying to understand Neriocystis better. These are kelp gametophytes here. This is what they look like in culture. So zoospores from the sporophytes were released in culture and grew into these gametophytes. Then we can do genetics on the haploid phases, for example, to understand how much genetic diversity is in these regional kelp forests. And to be sure that if we want to restore Neriocystis, we're restoring genetically diverse populations. And we're also, it's a way to, to study the life cycle, to find out better ways to raise Neriocystis in captivity. It's a big kelp and you wanna get it big enough so it's not vulnerable to the urchins. So you're playing a game with a herbivore and its prey and there's only so much we can do. But these are very um, promising methods to, instead of just watch the kelp go away, to try to understand what's happening and to make some reparations. You can tell how, how labor intensive these are to actually grow enough stars to eat all these urchins, to actually collect enough urchins to relieve the population of urchins and to allow the kelp to regenerate. So in that scenario, this quote is harsh, but a whale guy, actually it's the guy who studied whale song said to be alive and explore nature now is to read by the light of a library as it burns. And I understand that helpless feeling that was, he wrote this at a time when whale populations had crashed. Whale populations are coming back. She said innocently, here is a friend of mine with his class holding Neriocystis. And I have reason for optimism because there are those people, there are those people, there are the, the young people, the people who are studying and interested. There is new technology. There's all sorts of change in humans that happens fast that may help us find new tools to work with reestablishing kelp for us. The hope of the future, the future generations. In addition, look at this. Satellite images show kelp forests has doubled in size after a dramatic collapse. What happened? Cold water is coming back. La Nina brings cold water to our coast in this horrible drought as well. But uh, there is fluctuation in seawater temperature and the colder water promotes the kelp. With that addition, it could be that our abilities to change population levels in stars and urchins might work because the kelp has a, a leg up with that cold water. Here's another quote, from a very recent paper that tries to forecast what will happen with the trends in our environment as they are now, which is more frequent heat waves, more unexpected epizootic pandemic outbreaks in invertebrates, and the incredible success of urchins, really. They've been around since the Mesozoic and they, they, they do so well as such simple organisms. So their forecasting suggests that substantial and specific ecological susceptibility in the next 80 years, as far as they're willing to, to um, predict, includes potential regional loss of canopy forming kelp, mostly because of temperature. 
warming temperature, less nitrogen. They were they're measuring nitrogen and forecasting that nitrogen will be less available because the water is warmer. And then there are subsequent changes in nearshore floop weds caused by the declining rates of various invertebrates. When the kelps go, there is less aerobic habitat for species, nearshore species associated near or by kelps. So there's a cascading events. So in the short term, things are going to go up and down, just like the graphs I showed you, up and down, up and down. In the long term, there's a general trend toward loss of important parts of our food web. But I like to remember that evolution is long, even though our vision is short. So let me take a, a moment to show you the evolution of the great kelps in the North Pacific. Here's the timeline from very long millions of years ago to the present. And these circles show um, genetic diversity of kelps at the time, sort of how they have evolved from an ancestor 35 million years ago into all the different kelps we have today. And this is done with DNA sequencing to backcast origins of our different species. So the blue circles here, the two blue circles are Alaska and our coast. So blue, this dark blue is Alaska, here's our coast. And you can see that our, those blue ones evolve very early in time. And here they all are. These green ones are Asian kelps. The red ones, which are fewer, are southern, southern hemisphere kelps. And then the yellow ones are Arctic kelps, very specialized for growing under ice here. So here is Nereocystis. And if you follow its trajectory in time from this ancestor, it's sister to Postelsia palmiformis. These two are closely related evolutionarily. They don't look much the same. We used to think we could read evolution by looking at form, but form is not as powerful as DNA sequence. So if you trace Nereocystis back, here it is in our uh, central west eastern Pacific coast. And it goes back about 11 million years from this ancestor this is when the species evolved. So Nereocystis isn't seeing its first rodeo, is all I can say, that over the last 11 million years, it has changed its habitat and its environment tremendously. Stellar sea cows used to come all the way down here and eat and sleep in the kelp. There were otters and otters form a cascade of herbivory and pr predation that involves urchins. So the presence of these different predators and herbivores over the millions of years of evolution have made, have strongly impacted the populations of these seaweeds. They're co-evolved. And I have to believe that that is happening now, that we're co- that that plants, animals, and seaweeds are co-evolving in our nearshore habitats through all the lumps that millions of years can produce, all the extinctions, all the changes of ranges, all the influence of humans. And it could be we lose some, but it could be that Nereocystis, maybe not with the same extent of, of habitat that it has now, but it's most likely to survive. I just want to be positive about that. So we can look at disasters that happen in the biological stage and the worry about its players. But I always try to take a long view of things, that if something evolved, then it's experienced. 